One minute ago, sensors at Lake Oroville triggered an alert that should not exist. Overnight, the reservoir surface climbed 23 feet without a single drop of rain. No storm crossed the Sierra Nevada. No upstream dam released its gates. No landslide crashed into the water. Yet, the gauges kept rising, hour after hour, until dawn revealed a lake transformed. What pushed 7 billion gallons upward in darkness? Is something breaking beneath California's most critical dam? And if the answer is underground, why are engineers more afraid than relieved? The first reading came at 0217 Pacific Time. A telemetry station on the dam's east abutment logged a surface elevation of 847.3 feet. By 0600, that number had reached 870.1 feet. No operator had ever witnessed such a vertical gain in such a short window. Redundant logging systems confirmed the trajectory. Backup staff gauges matched the digital output within two inches. But this was only the first warning. Control room technicians cross-referenced the data against three independent sources. Each system returned the same impossible curve. The California Data Exchange Center recorded continuous upward movement, no plateau, no stall, no correction. On-site operators verified the readings by visual inspection at sunrise. The instruments were not malfunctioning. The lake was actually rising. Standard protocol demands an explanation. Engineers began eliminating causes one by one. Doppler radar showed clear skies across the entire Feather River watershed. No precipitation had fallen in the previous 72 hours. Upstream reservoirs reported stable outflows. No dam operator had authorized an emergency release. Seismic monitors detected no landslide signatures. Satellite imagery revealed no debris field entering the reservoir. The Feather River stage remained flat, ruling out any hidden flash surge. Weather stations confirmed ambient temperatures and wind speeds within seasonal norms. Every known trigger had been crossed off the list. The water kept climbing anyway. By 0830, field crews reached the eastern shoreline. What they found confirmed the gauges were telling the truth. Water lines had migrated inland by more than 60 feet. The intake tower, normally surrounded by exposed rock, now stood with waves lapping at its lower service platform. Marker buoys anchored months earlier floated in positions that no longer matched their survey coordinates. Driftwood rested on benches that should have been 10 feet above the surface. A shift supervisor logged a single entry. It would later become the basis for an emergency declaration. The shoreline has moved. This is not instrumentation drift. Lake Oroville is not just another reservoir. It is the linchpin of California's state water project, the largest publicly built water conveyance system in the world. Its 3.5 million acre-feet of storage capacity feeds aqueducts stretching from the Sacramento Valley to the Mexican border. More than 27 million residents depend on water that passes through its spillways. What happens here does not stay here. Agricultural districts across the Central Valley draw irrigation allocations based on Oroville's levels. Hydroelectric turbines embedded in the dam generate enough power to supply a city of 800,000. Every foot of elevation change translates into millions of gallons and billions of dollars. When Oroville behaves strangely, the entire state holds its breath. The scars from 2017 have never fully healed. In February of that year, heavy rains pushed the reservoir toward capacity. Operators activated the main spillway to relieve pressure. Within hours, a massive crater opened in the concrete chute. Debris and muddy torrents cascaded down the hillside. Engineers switched to the emergency spillway, and earthen overflow never before used at full scale. That spillway began eroding within minutes. Head cuts advanced toward the dam crest. Authorities issued evacuation orders for 188,000 residents downstream. It was the largest dam-related evacuation in American history. Families fled with nothing but what they could carry. The crisis passed only after desperate drawdowns and emergency repairs, but the trauma remained embedded in the region's memory. 
For communities along the Feather River, any anomaly at Oroville triggers an immediate psychological response. The sight of rising water, the sound of sirens, the memory of midnight evacuations, these are not abstract concerns, they are lived experiences. When gauges began climbing without explanation, old fears resurfaced faster than any official briefing could contain them. The unexplained surge forced an immediate shift from analysis to action. The California Department of Water Resources activated its incident command structure before noon. Dam safety teams assembled at the operations center. Inspection crews deployed to every accessible sector of the embankment. Communication logs recorded a cascade of notifications to federal partners and downstream water districts. Checklists that had gathered dust since the last major inspection were suddenly urgent. Every seep, every drain, every piezometer weeding now demanded attention. Field investigators arrived at the reservoir's edge with GPS units and sampling equipment. The shoreline they encountered looked nothing like the maps in their binders. Mudflats that should have been dry were submerged. Access roads designed for drought conditions ended at water lines that had not existed 24 hours earlier. What came next shocked even the scientists. Ground instability forced crews to abandon certain inspection routes. Soft sediments that normally supported vehicle traffic had become saturated overnight. Safety protocols required photographic documentation of every anomaly. Chain of custody procedures governed every water specimen collected. The samples traveled under seal to the central laboratory. Technicians barcoded each container and initiated a battery of tests. Conductivity measurements came first, followed by turbidity analysis. Then the ion chemistry results started arriving. Inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry revealed trace elements that did not belong. Lithium concentrations exceeded typical surface water values by a factor of four. Boron levels matched signatures found only in deep geothermal systems. Rare earth element ratios pointed toward water that had spent decades in contact with basement rock. The chemistry told a story the gauges could not. Stable isotope analysis deepened the mystery. Oxygen-18 and deuterium ratios fell outside the range expected for Sierra Nevada precipitation. X-ray diffraction identified mineral phases, including zeolite and chlorite. These compounds form only under sustained heat and pressure at significant depth. Surface runoff could not produce these signatures. Whatever was filling Lake Oroville had not fallen from the sky. It had risen from below. The first hypothesis emerged from seismic records. A research team identified a cluster of microquakes beneath the lake's eastern arm. The events were small, magnitude 1.2 to 2.1, but their timing aligned precisely with the onset of the water surge. Fault structures mapped decades earlier showed fracture zones capable of connecting deep aquifers to the reservoir basin. Microseismicity, even at low magnitudes, can open pathways through fractured rock. Pressure differentials between confined groundwater and the lake's surface could drive enormous volumes upward. The pathways would need only to widen suddenly. But this remained speculation. No direct imaging confirmed an active conduit. The deep aquifer theory explained the chemistry and the isotopes. It even explained why the rise came at night when monitoring attention was lowest. But it left critical questions unanswered. Where exactly was the water entering? How long would the flow continue? Could it stop on its own, or was the reservoir now connected to a source far larger than anyone had mapped? The second hypothesis turned attention to the dam itself. Internal erosion, known in engineering circles as piping, begins invisibly. Water finds a path through the embankment and carries away soil particles. The channel gradually widens. By the time surface evidence appears, the damage may already be catastrophic. Turbidity spikes appeared in drain outputs along the dam's east gallery. Pore pressure readings from embedded piezometers showed anomalies correlating with the water rise. Some sensors registered increases that had not occurred since the 2017 crisis. The temporal alignment was too precise to dismiss. Engineers familiar with dam failure case studies recognized the pattern immediately. 
the Teton Dam in Idaho, collapsed in 1976 after piping eroded an internal pathway. The Sardoba Dam in Uzbekistan failed in 2020 when sustained seepage undermined its earthen core. The Vyant disaster in Italy killed nearly 2,000 people. Warnings were minimized and water levels allowed to climb unchecked. In each case, early signals were present. In each case, institutions hesitated. The parallels demanded independent review. An external engineer was brought in to audit the investigation. Her mandate was simple. Verify the data, challenge the assumptions, and ensure that institutional pressures did not contaminate the findings. Trust, already fragile after 2017, could not afford another failure of transparency. She ordered dual isotope analysis from a second laboratory. Acoustic Doppler current profiling would map any subsurface flows entering the reservoir. Piezometer gradient studies would determine whether pressure anomalies indicated internal movement or external intrusion. The answers would take days. The lake kept rising. On Lakeshore Drive, Maria Delgado stood at her kitchen window watching the waterline creep toward her property. She had lived through the 2017 evacuation, loading her grandmother into the back seat at 2 a.m. while sirens echoed through the canyon. Now the same dread had returned, quieter but no less real. Her neighbor's dock, installed two summers ago during the drought, was already underwater. The access road to the marina showed fresh mud at elevations that should have remained dry until spring. She had called the county emergency line twice. Each time, the answer was the same. Situation under investigation, no evacuation order yet. We are not waiting for an order this time, she said, stacking photo albums into plastic bins. Her voice carried the weight of a community that had learned not to trust reassurances. For families like hers, preparedness had become a way of life. Emergency bags sat by the door, gas tanks stayed full, and the lessons of 2017 were written into daily routines. Downstream, environmental monitors registered the first signs of ecosystem stress. Turbidity levels and outflow channels exceeded thresholds for salmon spawning habitat. Sediment mobilization threatened to release metals bound in reservoir bottom deposits. Water treatment facilities in Butte County reported changes in source water chemistry. The surge was not just a mystery, it was becoming a cascade. Ecosystems downstream had no time to adapt. Species that had survived decades of managed flows now faced conditions that no model predicted. Behind closed doors, competing narratives began to form. Agricultural water districts wanted answers that would protect their allocations. Urban agencies demanded assurances about supply reliability. Environmental groups questioned whether decades of operational decisions had weakened the system's resilience. Some stakeholders quietly favored the natural aquifer explanation. If the water came from below, the infrastructure remained blameless. Regulatory implications would be limited. Liability would evaporate into geological complexity. Others suspected the opposite. Internal seepage pointed to deferred maintenance, design flaws, or monitoring failures that no one wanted to acknowledge. The conflict was not just scientific, it was institutional, political, and deeply personal. Climate projections add another layer of uncertainty. Intensifying precipitation events, prolonged droughts, and aging infrastructure create conditions where anomalies become more likely. Dams designed for 20th century hydrology now face stresses their engineers never anticipated. Lake Warraville sits at the intersection of all these forces. Its embankment is more than 50 years old. Its spillways carry the scars of past crises. Its watershed responds to a climate that no longer matches historical patterns. The question is no longer whether anomalies will occur. The question is whether institutions will recognize them in time. Every surge carries a message. Every unexplained reading is a test of vigilance and response. Scientists now know that Lake Oroville's water surface rose 23 feet in a single night. No precipitation, no dam releases, no visible inflow. They know the chemistry points toward deep origin water. They know that drainage systems showed contemporaneous anomalies. They know that fault structures beneath the reservoir could theoretically provide conduits for aquifer intrusion. But critical gaps remain. What they do not know is whether the source will exhaust itself or continue indefinitely. 
They do not know whether the dam's internal integrity has been compromised. They do not know whether the next surge will be larger, faster, or more destructive. In a state that depends on this reservoir for survival, one question remains unanswered. If the warnings are real, will anyone act before it is too late?